And yeah, what up, everybody? It's your boy BQ back again here on the channel. I got my man Mike today. We're doing a this is my third installment of this talking TNA podcast. It's been pretty popular so far. And we're just we're just spitballing. Like there's no format, no nothing like that. That we're just we're just going with the flow, talking this TNA thing. And Mike is the one I'm I've been really excited to talk to, and I'll, I'll explain why here in a sec. But um, first, I'm gonna give him an opportunity to plug uh, his YouTube channel. This is this is my guy, and uh, you know, got to got to help him out. So I'm gonna also put his um, link in the pinned comment of this video. So yeah. Uh, what's up, guys? Hey, thanks a lot for having me, BQ man. We've been dude, we've been talking about doing this because we used to do something like you know, kind of semi regular, you know. And it um, it's been a while. We're both busy. We both got our own channels, but so I do appreciate you having me back on, man. And uh, yeah, so um, since the last time we spoke, I used to be on a on a network called Fight Game Media, and we were doing stuff for their YouTube and their Patreon. But uh, since then, JD and I have actually, um, we moved over to a network called Voices of Wrestling. So we're on the Voices of Wrestling network and we go, uh, and we also have our own YouTube channel. So we do our, our audio for our podcast is mostly Voices of Wrestling network. It's on all their platforms. And then our video, we go live on their channel and we simulcast on the Mike and JD show YouTube channel. Um, and that's where I do all my clips and I do exclusive videos. We do other exclusive live videos. We do all kinds of alternative content there. Um, so just look us up Mike and JD show YouTube channel or check us out in the pinned comment. And then we also have our own Patreon and that's where, yeah, it's where JD and I can just kind of riff and do our own, our own stuff and that's where you'll get to hear um brace for impact typically exclusively um i do eventually upload some of them onto youtube but for the most part you get them right away in your podcast feed right there on our on our patreon uh, brace for impact is still alive um still well it's just me kind of riffing I, I do a cheap poor man's intimidate or um um impersonation of bq where i'm just solo on the mic just spitting my thoughts about the, the current state of tna and and um and and having my own channel, it allows me to kind of go on whenever I want. When before I'd have to talk to the boss, be like, "Hey, can I drop some audio? This new story broke, and yada yada yada." Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. Well, me having my own Patreon, I can just do whatever I want. So um, we have the Mike and JD show on uh, on Patreon. We do another show called Overtime, where we do some historical content. We do some do some crazy shit. Like we did a whole podcast about aliens. We did a podcast about JFK. We did a whole podcast about movies. You know, we we do all kinds of crazy stuff there. Uh, JD has his JD Oliva Project podcast. He also has been uploading his book, chapters of his book that he's uh, coming out with recently. And he also posts all his articles on there exclusively um, before they get released uh, later later in the week. And so uh, tons of content, man. So if uh, you guys are a fan of this show, please uh, give us a shot, man. I'd appreciate it. So this is the reason I've really been wanting you on, man. Um, obviously, we love podcasting together. We talk yeah. every day. Um, so when the news came out that TNA was, or Impact was rebranded as TNA, you went live right after and you, were, yeah. you were not feeling it like you were just like absolutely not. this is not this is not it um and it's funny because um i think your tune has changed quite a bit since then oh yeah yeah so i dude what what, what is funny about it what, what is funny about it is that i actually i went live on our channel um and i before the show was over, I went live. So I went live because I was trying to beat Fightful and beat all these other other guys that were doing a a, um, a Bound for Glory review on their YouTube channel. So I went live, and before the show was over, so I had my iPad up while the announcement was happening. Now I thought the announcement, the, my, legitimately in my head, I thought the announcement was that Okada was going to make his return to Impact because that had already been teased in Japan. So that's what I thought it was going to be. And they do this long video. Um, it was like it had to have been like eight minutes of Frankie Kazarian coming out of the Lake of Rio incarnation. He's got this box, and then it's TNA, and I I shit over the whole thing, right? Because in my head, what I am remembering was like the dying days of TNA that I was like, this company needs to change. Um, we, we need to get out of this mode. So that's what I what I was reverting back to was those days. Right. And then I went to the Brace for Impact chat, which you're a part of, and the, the boys in there were super excited about it. And then I checked on Twitter and everybody was excited about it. And then I was like, OK, well, maybe I'm the one out of touch here. Right. If all these people that I respect that think it's a cool idea are into it, 
maybe it was just maybe it was just you know kind of a handful of us old heads that were kind of still stuck on the dark days of TNA. Um, I I really enjoyed you know the Impact era. I thought they got a lot of the stink off of what what TNA had uh, left on them, and so I was like, well, why would you go back to that? Well, we're we're seeing why people people actually like it, right? There was a lot of kids that are about 10 years younger than us, BQ, that, that grew up with it, right? Like I have one of my Ooh. listeners says he was 12 years old when he first started watching TNA when they were at their peak in like 2010, right? And now he's in his early 20s and he's been wanting them to go back to TNA ever since. So I was like, so I, I just listened to that and I learned and I was like, okay. And then I just started to get into it because I was like, well, you know what? You know, maybe, you know, 20, you know, 20, the, the Hogan era kind of what turned me off of TNA and um, I would say, you know, Dixie Carter um, grabbing Hogan's leg while he's walking out of the impact zone kind of killed my love for that promotion. But, um, you know, maybe maybe there is something to this and, you know, maybe bringing the letters back would mean something. And we've seen what it means. Right. Hard to kill is, uh, is a success so far. Right. So, so far, so good. And I'm, I'm really excited about this, uh, this new TNA. I think I think the TNA brand is just a lot cooler, um, you know. Who was I listening to? I wasn't listening, but it was I was reading an interview with Matt Riddle or something and not or something. It was, it was Matt Riddle, but he was saying, you know, I don't really want to go to AEW. You know, I'd rather do Japan, MLW. He's like TNA is an option. And I feel like in the past when it was Impact, you just didn't see someone departing WWE and they're talking about, oh, yeah, maybe Impact. Like it just never seemed like that was a cool place to go. And um, and. You know, it was just always everyone seemed laser focused on W. Uh, excuse me, on AEW. So um, I think it's just a a cooler brand. And you know, you and I were both proven very, very wrong about the attendance for Hard to Kill and Snake mm-hmm. Eyes you know, because they clearly knew what they were doing. Um, as a as a Las Vegas resident, they're going to pad the shit out of the show too. I, I know that. That's what they do for every single show on the strip. Like mm-hmm. if if it is not sold out, there's someone out there handing out tickets. Like we know that's going to happen, but it just seems like yeah. tickets are actually selling. And even like for snake eyes, which look like a nightmare. And what I was saying was like, they're relying on the TNA name to sell tickets and it's not working, but now it, it kind of seems like it's working. Like it did seem that, <laughs> I don't know if it was a matches or what, but um, there is a lot of local promotion here, which is crazy to me. I was driving uh, to work, this happened twice just driving to work i just look off to the side and there's a huge tna billboard i don't mean like a little you know sign i'm talking large you know billboard off the freeway so we were definitely proven wrong you were just saying that today yeah. actually I believe. yeah yeah and i'm i'm happy to be wrong about that because but you know what but i had evidence to back me up i had evidence that they wouldn't be able to get this thing done um and uh, they were uh, they were so far behind at one point like at one point like just a few weeks ago they were at like 300 tickets sold for uh, a show where they had 1100 tickets on sale right for snake eyes mm-hmm. um but i think as the event got closer you know they started to ramp up their their uh, not, not only their online promotion but their local promotion the billboards are a big deal like having that billboard outside out front of the palms like you can see that billboard from the 15, right? Like you're, you're driving up, you can see the palms and then you see that billboard you're like, Oh my God, look, there's wrestling, right? Like wrestling's coming yeah. out of the palms. The palms is a premier destination. Like that, that is a big time casino. And that, and honestly, when they first started going to Samstown, I was always pretty adamant that like, no, you gotta look, you probably can't afford to go to planet Hollywood or you probably can't afford to go to city center or the MGM grand, but you know, palms is still big time enough and it's a little bit off the strip. I think you could probably get there. And I just remember those old ultimate fighter shows at the Pearl. Um, so they have a history of combat sports. Um, and it's kind of like a legendary venue in combat sports, especially for smaller time stuff. And I, I, I always thought that they should go there. And I'm just so excited that they're going there. I love the look of it. I think it sounds great when it's on television. And then of course you're, you're, you know, you're being at the Palms. I think it's a tremendous deal, and I'm just super excited for them. I'm excited for everybody. They they really sold these tickets because the card is not special. Yeah. It it really the card is a normal Impact Wrestling card, right? Like everybody that you see on these cards, with the exception of the Grizzly Young Vets, you've seen them all in Impact before, right? Uh, and Alexander Hammerstone, but nobody knows who that guy is except for us, right? 
So he he's Good not market. he's not gonna, he's not really going to sell you any tickets. So they they sold this whole thing on excitement over the rebrand, off of the tease of something big coming. The you know a huge signing and when worlds collide, uh, those two teases, and and it just a really awesome like um and Lou D'Angeli deserves a lot of praise here as the guy that kind of promotes this stuff for them. He's a Las Vegas resident too and used to promote Cirque du Soleil uh, there on the strip and he's a he's a big time guy. Um just a really like boots on the ground great um local promotion that they've done. Uh, right now they've sold over 1200 tickets. I think that uh, Dobby the Brain Heenan, uh, a listener of mine I think you checked your show out too. Um, sent me a message. I think they're like twelve eighty last he checked, and uh, with fourteen hundred on sale um, because they just put some more seats on sale today. I think they're gonna, you know, probably increase it. They're probably gonna get closer to, you know, sixteen seventeen hundred. And then, like you said, with the way the Palms can have guys out there, like just slinging them tickets, you know, out there on the strip, and then out throughout the casino, bringing people from the craps table and from the slot machines, and you know, padding it. You know, they they might end up getting a lot of people on those top ble- those top bleachers that haven't even gone on sale yet. I'm really curious to see, you know, because I'll be there. Um, I'm really curious to see what what it looks like from the inside, because in the Brace for Impact chat, chat, I'm always saying, hey, Bound for Glory 2018, I was there. I think it was about 2,500 people. But now looking back at it, man, that sounds like a lot of people because they've, they've never yeah. really gotten anywhere near that before. So I might yeah. be a bad guesstimator. So I'm actually really interested to see what it looks like, because I remember 2018 in my head pretty well. So. I'm, I'm curious to compare the two. Um, I drove past Samstown Casino for the first time a couple months ago. And, you know, I kind of got on here. I was like, dude, Samstown is not that far from the Palms. It's like 20 minutes, you know? So I, was, I wasn't I was actually that optimistic that being at the Palms compared to Samstown was that big of a deal. Uh, as far as the local promotion, I think uh, the billboards being by, closer to the Strip mean something. You know, obviously Sam sounds a lot further from the strip, but it's not like that much further. So I was, I was kind of like, I don't know if this is really going to be that much of a game changer, but you know, God, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if this wasn't the yearly venue for it, you know? Yeah. I, but I think that would be cool. But here, here's, here's the problem with Sam's town. Have you ever been inside that casino? I haven't been. Okay. If you if you've never been there, guys, and I I have been there several times because whenever I was stationed at Nellis, I lived I, I lived about ten minutes from that casino, so that was kind of like our spot to go to TGI Fridays and to go bowling. And there there was like this classic rock cover band that was always there, so we'd go check that out. Um, there's not a single good looking person in that building. There just isn't. There's no young people. It's a bunch of it's a ton of old geezers. It's a really kind of a, it's not like not a dingy or a um, like not a well cat. Like it's like they, it's a very clean casino, but it's geared towards old people. It's like an old West saloon type of feel and old people come in on the bus all the time and they sit there all day and they play their slot machines. It is very much geared toward geezers, right? Nobody cool goes to Sam's town um, except for me, of course, because I, I went to Sam's town often. But um, that was that was essentially the problem with Samstown, and so, um, but with the Palms, like that's right. It's it's not on the Strip, but it's like right around the corner, and it's across from the Rio, which is another big time casino, and it's right next to the I-15, which is like the major highway that runs through Las Vegas, and everybody's you know accessible to it. So, um, you know, a lot of cool people like to go to the Palms, and I'll tell you a quick story. And and BQ just um, BQ just dropped out of the dropped out of the chat. So um, BQ just dropped out of the chat. Uh, just one sec. So I was there one night, and uh, I used to go there all the time to the Palms. But one one night in particular, I was um, I was waiting in line, and I had a group of people with me, and the the wait. Um, to get in to Rain Nightclub. Rain was the big nightclub there. They had a few. They had Playboy Club. They had Ghost Bar. Uh, but Rain was like the biggest nightclub that they had. So I'm waiting in line. And while I'm in line, what well, here walks past like mini me, um, Jessica Simpson, <laughs> Linda Hogan, and her new boyfriend. I also heard that Paris Hilton was there. And all these celebrities were showing up, right? It was it was like the hot place to be. And um and so I immediately walked over to the security guard. I was like, hey, how much to get me ahead of this line? 
and the guy goes drop a hundo in my in my in my hand and uh, you guys can come uh, come out of the line I'm like cool drop the hundo me and my me and my friends go right past them we get in and we're um we're we're, we're there we actually didn't see any of those people <laughs> in the club because they had their own vip section there was like a whole section thing off um but while we were there we're hanging out we're taking shots we're we're partying and then all of a sudden rizza from wu-tang clan um takes over the dj booth and this place just lost it it was just a, a tremendous moment and um I'll, I'll never forget that but i i used to spend a lot of my nights there and they have like a really really awesome pool and then of course the the pearl is fantastic i saw lots of bands there i saw i saw limb biscuit at the pearl i saw um several other concerts at the pearl um that is a tremendous concert venue that a lot of people go to and i watched like on television many of the great ufc fights in history that before ufc got really really big they used to run the pearl at the palms all the time um, if you guys have ever heard of Forrest Griffin versus Stefan Bonner, it happened right there at the Pearl. Uh, Nick Diaz versus Diego Sanchez, one of the legendary UFC fights in history, happened right there at the Pearl. So um, that's why. Samstown is geared towards geezers. That's why nobody goes to that fucking place. Um, and the Palms is cool. And that's why people like it, right? So they went to a cool place. They're they're attaching themselves to something cool. And that's why this shit is working so well. Because they they finally upgraded their facility so bq you're back i just took over your show for a while and riffed while you were off but i i i went ahead and talked about told some stories uh from my days at the palms whenever i was stationed at nellis so, so stories that i can tell on there there's some stories like i still don't think i'm allowed in ghost bar like not that i would go because i'm a 40 year old dad and i don't drink anymore but they probably saw my picture up at that place because i got kicked out of there a couple times i didn't know you were at nellis before uh yeah from uh 2007 to 2011 yeah that was, okay. dude, I, I loved that place. I'd go back in a heartbeat. I'm actually not at Nellis. I'm at Creech. So I have a I have a good hike, like an hour when I have to go to base. You're, yeah, you're up there where the hills have some eyes, huh? <laughs> yeah. Indian Springs to, middle of nowhere. Yeah, I used to do some work up there because I'm a bioenvironmental engineer. And so we had assets up there with the Predators and the Reapers. So any, mm -hmm. any type of aircraft we have requires aircraft maintenance. So I would go and do their inspections and do all that stuff and uh those guys deploy a lot too so uh good good guys yeah. out there yeah but in <laughs> indian springs they have a, um a little a little casino a, like restaurant out there right outside the base at least they used to when i was stationed there that yeah. uh they had pretty pretty decent hamburgers but i think they were still allowing like the waitresses to smoke and stuff <laughs> it was it was, it was a kind of a old school type of field man because you're out there in the middle of nowhere yeah it, it is it is definitely in the middle of nowhere I'm hoping, even though I cut out, that this continues to record okay. It did. Um, yeah, no, I, I checked the clock. We were still going. I was just riffing, so you okay, can keep it. Cool. Yeah, it's still, it, no, I was, I, I told some pretty good stories about what, and and you'll hear whenever you, you upload it, but yeah, you can <laughs> okay, keep it. Cool. Great. <laughs> yeah, just like cut out. I heard my son upstairs cursing and everything. I was like, oh, great. What happened? Damn internet. <laughs> um, so let's talk these titles real quick because. Uh, the last several days they've been putting out the titles and Lord knows I've hung my hat on destroying their social media and the way that they, um, they do things the way they've done things over the years. And I'm so, so pleased with what they're doing right now. And it gives me a little bit of validation because people are seeing now when you do social media correctly, like how powerful it is. And I know you can't release belts every other month, you know, mm -hmm. that's where you have to be creative, but good social media is so so powerful but uh what are your overall thoughts on the belts and the way they're coming out and uh, i mean just the, like it really it's like something i would have come up and would come up with in my head where i'm like <laughs> yeah. do a video then post yeah. a picture of the wrestler with the belt and then the belt by itself i mean that's like the kind of shit i'm always preaching so yeah i love seeing know, it. they hit a grand slam home run with this whole presentation it was absolutely perfect. I each belt was tremendous. I love every single belt. I love everything about them. I've seen some minor nitpicks here and there, and I don't care about them. I think the belts are so fantastic that you can tell they actually spent money on these things. 
right um, they look, they, yeah because it looked like they the old belts look like something you could just buy off amazon like they're trash they they really they really are like like i didn't <laughs> think they were that bad but when you hold them up next to you the can. new belt it's like oh my god it's like oh my god it's like a whole and, and but that was the that was the thing like they're spending money on like they're taking this thing serious right and it tells me that they're actively trying to turn things around and i'm and i and i'm like oh good Hell yeah. Like, so each, each belt I thought looked amazing, looked tremendous. The new world heavyweight title, I think is my new favorite version of that title. Although I, I reserve the right to revert back to the, uh, the, the old one that, that Moose held at any point in time. Uh, if I see an old clip, I can change my mind. But as of right now, that's my favorite. And then of course the belt that Trinity has the knockout title is my absolute favorite version of the yeah, knockout same. title. I, and that's, and that's probably the nicest belt of the whole bunch. I, I thought, I thought they hit a home run and the social media campaign was fantastic. The way that they did it, it was right out of the BQ playbook. They, they really did. They, they, they knocked it right out of the park. Um, and I, I really don't think they could have done it any better. And I'm in, so as part of the voices of wrestling network, I'm a part of their Slack channel. Um, I don't know if you ever had Slack for like work or anything, but it's kind of like a work mm -hmm. space type of thing. And, and, um, and I'm in there with a bunch of people that are on that network and, there's some there's some straight up haters in there of TNA like legit like haters and even then they were like you know these belts are tremendous and just one compliment after another and so that's when you know you really hit a home run is the, even when the haters like take a break from being haters like they 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 absolutely nailed it I, and I'm just so happy for them and and I'm just super excited uh, for the direction. What were your thoughts when um? the digital media championship, we knew that it's going to continue to be a thing. I was listening to Busted, Ro Busted Open yes, this morning or yesterday, and Tommy Dreamer is very aware of people's hatred for him holding that title. You know, he, <laughs> it, it's funny because um, I, I, you always wonder how much a wrestler is like really in tune. Do they, do they, you know, do they read their replies and all that? He 100% is aware, and he's he doesn't agree with it. You know, no, but yeah. um, you know, he, um, I have several messages from him and I'm just going to point them on the screen. And he did um, say I DM people. Yeah. He did say that. Yeah. He, he DMs people. Right. And then here's his DMS with me from different things I've said about him online. It just goes on. Right. So this is just over the years. So he is very aware he is. And I never tag him by the way. He is a, a habitual vanity searcher and he'll hop into your DMs. And you know what pisses me off the most about Tommy Dreamer? Hmm. He's so nice when he hops in your DMs. He doesn't he doesn't yell at anybody, he doesn't disrespect anybody. He's just super nice and polite and professional. The the first time he ever DM'd me was because there was an episode of Impact. And this was during the pandemic era where they were taping things out of order and things were crazy. Well, they taped a scene with Tommy Dreamer, and I can't remember who he was in the scene with but he was wearing one shirt, right? And then they go to commercial, they go to commercial and they come back and he's wearing a different shirt. Just, and, and I, and I commented on that. He goes, well, you never changed your show, your, your clothes in the middle of a show before. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> At least he's, I mean, he does not strike me as someone who has thin skin. So yeah, I'm sure he can handle it, but it's, he's, he did say that, that he DMs people. He's pretty, he's pretty self-aware, but he also is like, he's like old school. He's not going to turn down bookings. Right. <laughs> and so, um, you, you know, if he took better care of himself, you know, and was a, bit, a bit better in the ring, I don't have a problem with a guy his age, like doing that. I made the joke and I was surprised he didn't DM me. Is like, you have an analog wrestler holding a digital title. I thought that was a pretty fucking good joke. Right. Um, but it's not, it's not about, it's not about his age. It's just the guy's so out of shape. He doesn't take care of himself. Um, and the, the matches, you know, he's had a couple good ones here and there, but for the most part, they're just not any good. And we, we need some, we need some new young blood in there to hold that title. Yeah. And I don't even have as much as I've complained about Tommy Jerm over the years. My concern, I mean, my work, my complaints, I'm sorry, is him in the main event, uh, which hasn't been an issue recently. And then the yeah. concept hardcore matches, which he hasn't been doing that either. So. I don't mind him being like featured on the show. I don't want him to retire or anything like that. Like it's nothing like that, but um, you know, I, I think everyone wanted to see Kenny King hold that title. And um, mm. I, I'm just, uh, 
were kind of spiraling out because I was really what I was asking was I don't really know your overall thoughts on the title and if you were like kind of disappointed that it's going to continue because they've had this beautiful belt now so we're in it for the long haul mm -hmm. this isn't, yeah. it's not going to be gone next year you know really you know it's not it's not so much the title but when they introduced it they immediately told me it was nothing to care about yeah they, and, and and i'm like okay well then i just don't care about it right and but then whenever something gets thrown into my face over and over again that i clearly don't care about then i just start to resent it and that's kind of where we're at with that title um they did have um jordan grace and matt cardona i thought were really good digital media champions i thought joe hendry was a good digital media champion um but in between those stints were just you know you know kenny kenny king um him having it i thought was cool but they didn't really do anything with him when he yeah. had it so so they they make the title meaningless and it they it, it never really became what they intended it to become which was them like it being like their internet champion yeah. where they're doing exclusive matches on the inter on the internet and stuff like that but instead it's on the regular tv show it's on pay-per-views it's on the pre-shows it's all over there it's just like another title and um and at the same time they keep telling me not to care about it so i'm like yeah. so whenever people bring it up i'm just like i'm just ready to move on i just don't i just don't care now if they made it a serious championship like a serious mid-card championship that the wrestlers actually cared about instead of a joke championship then maybe i i would start to care again because you can make a title mean more um, if you put it on somebody who's meaningful i said the other day there's a there's a and I say jokingly, but that there's a higher probability Scott Demore takes that title home than Tommy Dreamer does. You know, yeah. like I just it doesn't strike me like the wrestlers really care if they have it. Um, I, I got to ask you this: what what is? Because I actually don't know the answer to this. What has been like your main issue with Impact over the last several years? Like, what was what was like your you're one thing that you're just like, man, I'm just not feeling this about the show right now. This is what I really think they need to change. So, yeah. so it's kind of like, what are you hoping is your the biggest improvement going into, you know, this energy? It, it's it's energy. Um, I when whenever um, people people show up, the impact zone doesn't go crazy. It just does. There's no energy in the room. There just there just isn't. Every week on Dynamite, it's like a party like atmosphere. And then you get that right. for a lot of the WWE shows too. And when it's not like that for WWE shows, they pop, they put in fake crowd noise, right? So they always make it seem like there's energy and a lot of times impact because it's the same people that go to these shows over and over again. And they've seen all this stuff time and time again. And a lot of them are just sitting on their hands. Um, and it's not their fault. It's, you know, impact's not giving them a product worth getting excited over. The most excited I've ever seen an impact audience was during Will Ospreay versus Speedball. I've like the whole time I've been covering them during the Anthem era, I've never heard a crowd like that. And I was like, why can't it be like this all the time? Right. So that's that's right. really what I'm challenging them to have. Now the TNA era in the impact zone in Orlando, you had that a lot of times, right? They they constantly had energy. They had new exciting talents coming in. They had young exciting talents coming in, making a name for themselves. Right. But with impact, you get a couple of young guys. But for the most part, it's WWE fireds that never really made it. They're in their 40s and they're just they're just there chilling, waiting to get their next run back in WWE. Right. And like like Heath is a perfect example. Like that guy came in. He didn't do a goddamn thing. Right. Like he never really had a meaningful feud. He would come in. He would lose a lot of matches. They would put him up to the main event a couple of times and, and he would never win. And so, and that contributed to the lack of energy in the promotion, right? And I, I, I would say that's that's been the the my biggest takeaway from the uh, the Impact era was just a sheer lack of energy surrounding the company. And I, I've brought this up many times before. I think a lot of that lack of energy. Now I haven't been to a, a TV taping since Orlando, which I've been to several over there, but. I, you know, I stayed true that I would not go to a show until we on the night was gone. And I, and I, yeah. I was thinking I may never go to a show again, but when I, when I was at those shows, which, what I always felt was like, I had no clue what was going on because yeah. we didn't see the backstage promos, the storylines. I've brought up this story many, many times over the years, but the, like the funniest thing to me was I was watching an angle. It was Eli Drake versus 
uh, Grado contract on a pole match. And at the time, Eli Drake was aligned with Jesse Goddard's. And Jesse Goddard's came and interfered in the match. The very next match was the return of the bromance. The next match. Um, and I, I've told that story many times, but the reason I bring it I bring it up is because the crowd was like, what, what the hell just happened? Mm-hmm. Like, we just saw this dude come out here as a heel, and then he's a baby face 10 minutes later. You know, because they tape things out of order. I don't know if they yeah. still do that. I don't know their, their approach, but I think there's just a real real disconnect with the live audience. Uh, the, the other example I bring up all the time, I wasn't there, but do you remember the storyline where Josh Josh Matthews came out as like the spiritual advisor of Matt Seidel? Were you watching back then? I was, yeah. Yeah. It was and he not, came not out, crazy. and it was like a <laughs> fart in church. Yeah. <laughs> but the problem was the entire story was built in backstage segments. Mm-hmm. So when yeah. he came out and all of a sudden he's this like heel manager dude, they're standing there like, what the hell? You know, same grand championship, same thing. They didn't explain the rules to the to the uh, people in the impact zone. So all of a sudden these dudes come out and they're doing like three round matches. You know, so I, I think I would imagine they've improved since then. I can't speak for what they do now, but I still feel that there probably is a huge disconnect where people don't know the storylines. They're seeing mm-hmm. the same person wrestle multiple times in a day. Yeah. You know. Because you remember in the in the past, like storylines used to leak online where now they don't leak as much because I think they try to present the show like where they just do the wrestling in front of a crowd and all the storylines are built in the backstage in, segment yeah. so that you can't right. spoil anything. Right. Well, and then what happens with that is like nobody knows why these people are wrestling. So therefore right. there is there is no heat. Right. Yeah. They they bring these matches out cold and then therefore you have a cold audience and and that's and that's what happens. And that's been a big part of the lack of energy. And they weren't even announcing. I think they've done a little bit better over the last year. So they weren't even announcing, say, something was a number one contender match for the world title like they Penzer did not do that. He just the next the following contest is scheduled <laughs> for one fall. And, you know, you don't know what they're actually fighting for. You know, so um, I think they improved with that. I want to say they, they have over the past year, but yeah, yeah, there's yeah, no, but yeah, de- definite lack of energy. I wouldn't say it's like quiet, quiet, but you know, yeah, I mean, like the uh, the the clip that's always in my head is when um, Bobby Fish in his hometown <laughs> comes out. And he's cutting this promo and nobody cares. And they're all sitting on their hands. Right. And like, I, I just, I just see that all the time. And so that's, you know, you know what, I, you know, when we've already talked about critiques, critiques of the production and this and that, you know, in two, from 2005, I would say to about 2012, um, TNA was a movement, right? It was like something you can get behind. Right. And then that movement started to die off because we got so sick of Hogan and Bischoff. Right. But like people like wrestlers wanted to be a part of something. They wanted to be part of something greater than themselves. And so did the fans. Right. Mm-hmm. They wanted to be a part of this little engine that could is taking on this big, bad corporation at WWE. Right. But now you don't you don't have that. And I think that contributes to the lack of energy. At least you did in the impact wrestling era. You did. Because you know, and the and the way just Scott Demore's personality, and this is not a knock on him. This is his personality. He just wants to be friends with everybody. He just wants to get along and and do all these things. And uh, you know, hey, wrestlers, you can come in for a few months and uh, collect your paycheck and go back to the bigger company. And and yeah. he kind of accepts being treated as less than, right? Like he he they've made it very clear that imp, the Impact Wrestling era was not a they were not a destination promotion. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, like, and that's, and you were talking about that earlier when you brought up the riddle quote, like people didn't even think to go there. Um, they were like, and you've said this many times, you've done a good job on your show. Like they just treat impact like another independent booking. And that's yeah. kind of what they were being treated as they were like, like um, a, a independent company with souped up production. Right. 
But now I think what they're trying to do with this new TNA wrestling era, and you've seen it with TNA plus, which appears to be working smoothly. I'm going to give it a couple months. I'm going to let all you fuckers go in there and, and, and get all the kinks out. Um, you know, get all the recalls done and figure that out for me and tell me it's good before I sub, I, I create a sub for it. But you know, it looks like they're taking that, that platform seriously, which they did not with impact plus before it was an atrocious, um, it was awful. Right. Yeah. But the, the new belts are taken seriously. They're doing the palms are taking that seriously and then of course they're making these huge money offers to these free agents who you know unfortunately for tna the reason why these free agents aren't taking these big money offers i'm sure they would love to is because their platform is so small compared to the other yeah. two promotions right so it's like if you match aew like so so they made a big push for osprey right and and this is what i'm getting back to with the movement like that was me that was them signaling to everybody else that they're in the game now they want to be a part uh, of this, right? They're they're ready to compete. They're ready to get out there and get after it. And so much so that they made a big money offer to Will Ospreay, knowing that damn well they would never get their return on investment, right? But they still made the big money offer to tell people they're ready to get after it. So mm -hmm. they make this offer, and I, I get the feeling that it was pretty comparable to what AEW offered, but the platform is not comparable, right? You know, right. You're, you're talking about getting a tenth of the the live television ratings and you're talking about doing you know f maybe 14 1500 in the palms which would be very very good for tna but if aew did that for collision coming up in henderson that would be seen as a complete failure right so so it's just it's different right they 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 were and that's not a knock on tna that's just where they're at right now but i get the feeling like they were trying to get to that next level by making money offers to you know CM Punk and Will Ospreay like they're trying to get to that next level when before I never felt like they were trying I felt like they were just mm -hmm. they were just cool being off doing their own shit not bother nobody not worrying about anybody and just putting out some decent television and doing these little shows and these little bars you know like the, the bar they did in Kentucky all those times and all these other mm -hmm. little places I uh, I think they were just content with that when now they're they're they were content with being content for access right that's yeah, what they were yeah that, and, that's, and and now they're getting after they're in the game now is what i'm getting at yeah absolutely i think that's what tw and i talked about a lot over the past few years was that it just felt like they were really content with where they were at and they would take a swing here and there whether it was a storyline or, or whatever you know they i'm not mm -hmm. saying they were just you know completely stagnant or, but there was definitely like a level of like hey we're content where we're at you know and you definitely feel a shift right now that's the biggest biggest difference when they when they rebranded to impact that was like out of necessity and there was no hype behind it and it was there was no game plan behind it they you know they brought in a few new faces that we had never seen before and you know they brought in like which reno scum who i like them very much uh is my guy but uh you know brought him in they brought in km you know, like <laughs> follow up. Yeah, you know, they probably these dudes. We weren't really familiar with them. We, you know, grew the like to like them a little bit, but there was there were no signings that were like, yo, you know, this is a new era. It was just like that. They're just these are just guys here. So you bring up Bobby Fish, man. I was actually thinking today, dude, I wouldn't be surprised if he isn't one of the the I don't know what he's doing right now. I think he's doing like MMA or something, but I wouldn't be surprised yeah, if he wasn't one of the signings. He's doing a podcast. Um, it, I, I wouldn't see them signing him, but I could see him doing shots again for for TNA. I, I could see that yeah. absolutely. I was actually shocked that he was only around for probably a day of taping. <laughs> I don't even think he was there for a full taping. Bobby Fish is a great talent. He's a he's he's closer to fifty than he is to forty. And um, crazy, yeah. yeah, and he uh, he's a little bit of a pain in the ass. So. <laughs> that's, that's that's why he got that's why he lost his job at wwe and aew within like a year do you think we're going to see an influx of aew talent show up so if you think about frankie kazarian when he showed up i was thinking this may open the floodgates for wrestlers to be like hey i want more for myself but yeah frankie yeah. kazarian is older and i don't think the younger wrestlers are ready to say that yet i mm -hmm. think i don't think they're ready you know we don't see them purposely trying to get out of AEW. I thought maybe some would follow him, but I'm starting to think it's more of a reality now that TNA could be a destination because, I mean, AEW is not putting on good television 
and they're just signing anyone from WWE now. I mean, they're so mm-hmm. far gone from what they used to be. And now they're letting a lot of contracts run out. I just, I don't know, like the way Alan Angels came over, I feel like we're getting more in 2024. Like, do you think that finally we're going to see some people, whether it's a yeah. good or bad thing, but do you think we're going to see start seeing, you know, influx from there? I, th- I think eventually somebody's going to um, get in Tony's ear and be like, you have way too many wrestlers on the contract. Yeah. And none of them are producing. Um, a lot of them don't come to the shows. So uh, I, th- I think, I think it's inevitable. I think that, um, you know, you brought up Sean Spears, you know, Mike Santana, I think his deal's coming up soon. We just saw Andrade leave. I think he's heading back to WWE, but yeah, we could definitely see some guys. I don't think if, I don't think Mike Santana's coming. I know he's like on everyone's dream list, but I think he, he, the rumors were he wanted to go to NXT or T's. Well, I don't know how true it is. And Ortiz wanted AEW. So yeah. I think, you know, I think if that's an option for him, I could just see him going. I, I don't think he wants to – like Ortiz, I could see coming back. Like if his contract was up, like I could see him returning. But I think Santana has bigger aspirations. I think Santana so really wants to be – a. I think Santana really wants to be a main eventer, and I just don't see – that happening for him in WWE, I do see that happening for him in TNA. I think they would really like him and push him to the top. I think they would, especially now that he's like, you know, his promos are on lock. He's always had good matches, but now he's like 40 pounds heavier, you know? Yeah, yes, he's a beast now. You know, I was going to put us in a brace for Impact Chat, um, but I saw it like maybe 15 minutes before we went on. Brian Cage is Facebook. It's full of all sorts of grammatical errors because this guy, I don't know why, but (laughs) he did a whole long post about his time in Impact and Mm. being excited to see what they're doing here in the future. And he brought up like I did gut check and then I ended up being the X Division champion of the world. It was a very interesting post. And uh, I know they rolled. I feel like they rolled his contract over recently. I don't know if he resigned or not. He resigned. Yeah. He did. He, he, okay. Yeah, he leaked. He leaked that he was going to sign with WWE, but I don't think they were ever interested. Um, right. You know, because you know, as much of a joke as WWE's wellness policy is, they still test. AEW doesn't test, neither does TNA. So I just don't think he would go go to WWE uh, unless they can get him on some type of waiver to not ever test for steroids. Like, it's just not yeah. Yeah. The reason I brought that up, I didn't know what his contract status was, and I was like, dude, it almost feels like he's feeling it out, but. At the same time, when I read that post, it was kind of like what I said about Riddle. Like, no one is in the past was like, hey, my time and impact. You know, like, people have completely moved on and not not looked behind them. That's why I get so mad when they're these social media posts of, hey, AJ Styles was here and Samoa Joe and, and uh, fucking who else? Kurt Angle. Like, yeah. Kurt Angle always says good things about TNA, but, I mean, they are bringing up people who – want nothing to do with this company you know that's why that's yeah. why i get so freaking mad but uh, just, so just to see brian cage actually say something positive about his former employer was just very different, different yeah and in, in, in the past and by all accounts he's just a very good dude like people really like that guy um and um he never really became what i think he thought he was going to become an aew he just never did um um, but he also has a family and he likes he likes money and so and they're booking him quite frequently now and so he's never going to be a top guy there but he'll always be kind of factored in on you know collision rampage and doing stuff like that and doing run-ins here and there and like he'll get like a seasonal push kind of like lance archer does like he'll come in every six months and get a push and so um yeah. he's got a, he's got a, he's got a good spot there but uh yeah no so you know i thought it was very curious when the tna thing was announced and scott demore came out and said look we're 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 going to treat this thing right. It's going to be a big deal. And then all of a sudden, Camille Brickhouse doesn't want to be an NWA anymore because now she sees, hey, there's other options out there. Same yeah. thing with Alexander Hammerstone. And now people are asking out of their contracts and they're letting their contracts expire. There's like, there's a new player in the game here, mm-hmm. right? To 
competitive offers, which has then driven AEW and WWE to make even more competitive offers. And I think that that helps everybody. So they're probably both those companies are probably pretty annoyed at TNA right now because they're probably spending a little bit extra money on some of these guys that they probably didn't want to spend because now there is a third party interested because as much as a lot of talent like to go to New Japan just to check that box, New Japan's not paying very much money. They don't have the resources they used to have, which is why Will Ospreay and Jay White are in the States now, right? And so um, they just don't have those resources, which is why you're going to see, like, they never made an announcement that uh, Dolph Ziggler signed with New Japan. He's just going to work some dates there to check that box because at some point in your career, like a lot of wrestlers, they want to test themselves in Japan, right? And so, um, but, you know, I, I think, I think, you know, going forward, I think TNA could end up becoming a, a destination company for people, and I hope that it, I hope that it happens. What do you think about? So I made some predictions about people I could see signing. What are your thoughts on the probabilities of Mandy Rose showing up, um, Lacey Evans that I brought up? The reason I'm yeah. saying this is because you lose Trinity. You're not paying Mickey James anymore. You lose Deanna Perrazzo. There's money available, and it's in the mm-hmm. knockout division. And you have you you don't have anyone to build it back up with. Look at the the Ultimate X field. Yeah. You know, okay, cool. It's Ultimate X, so we'll enjoy it. But I mean, I was it. I like their social media campaign for it, but then when they put the graphic out with all the competitors, I was like, Yeah, it's they're, not a who's who. <laughs> right, they're thin. Yeah, they're they're, yeah. they're thin. They're gonna there's gonna be a kendo stick, and they're gonna rely on some bullshit for the you know yeah. for the spots. But um, yeah. what do you, what do you think? Because they have to beef up the knockouts division, and the money's available. So do you think mm-hmm. there's you know? Am I completely like in left field here with thinking I, I, those are possibilities? Brother, you're not only in left field. I think you're in foul territory. Right? <laughs> Yeah, th- with, with those two, with those two specifically, with those two specifically, I, I, I don't see. I think if they were gonna get Mandy Rose, they would have gotten her a long time ago. Like she was, she's been available for a long time. She didn't appear to want to do that. And I think that she seems like the type that's only gonna do it if WWE calls, right? Um, you know, Lace, Lacey, uh, or what's her name, Lacey, Lacey um, Evans. I, w- yeah. I kept wanting to call her Lacey Von Eric, but her name's Macy. Some uh, she's a Marine though, so I always have Very her nice. back. Yeah. Um, um, you know, she never really made it in WWE. The, 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 she just couldn't get it all together. And, uh, and that was unfortunate. You, you would hope, you know, somebody that's part of, you know, our little military family would kind of get it, but it just never, it's never really worked out for her. And she started her own small business and she does her online stuff. And, uh, she, she seems yeah. like the type that just doesn't need wrestling. Not that she didn't like wrestling. She just, doesn't need wrestling. And you're seeing that with some of these other, these, these latest cast offs from, from there that, that have, that have backup plans, right? <laughs> like, yeah. like, and in the Marines, you know, you know, maybe she had a backup plan. And so right, we just right. saw that with Rick, with Rick Books, who was a uh, Shinsuke's guitar player. He's like, I'm retired. I'm never wrestling unless it's WWE. I'm done. Right. You're, yeah. you're going to, you're going to see a lot of that from those type of people. Um, but you know, one of the names that keeps popping up BQ and I think, and, and if this happens, there's only one person to blame, and it's you. Honestly, this is going to be your fault. If I have That's to see, if I have to see the Bella Twins <laughs> in 2024, like this is all your fault because I think you're the only guy that I know that actually really likes them. <laughs> like, not that they're bad I people. I just like, that. oh, I thought that you liked them. Like, well, you no, you were, you, you did a whole podcast about that last year at some point, like in like four months ago. And, and and put, put that out there in the ether. And I saw people tweeting about that today. I was like, where is this coming from? Like, this BQ, like, still lingering out there with his theory? Um, you know, because they, they're available and there's money to be spent. And uh, they have crossover mainstream appeal. So if TNA is going to go for somebody, it might as well be them. But, you know. Hey, hey, Pat was telling me that, you know, there has to be a reason that they're announcing the knockouts tag team championships last and the yeah. fucking day of the pay-per-view. <laughs> Yeah. Because they've kind of teased that they're going to have opponents. Mm-hmm. They, they made a challenge, didn't they? Yeah. And there's not, I mean, like, you can't, oh, it's the Renegade Twins. Like, it, it's not, it has to be, there has to be some juice behind it. 
Right. And and look, and as much as I like, you know, the the wrestlers from Stardom and then the wrestlers from Japan, if you announce them right before the show or like the day before the show, that's not like it's going to get some of us that are online talking, but it's not like that's not going to do much, right? Like yeah. and as much as and I I think they should absolutely sign Miyu Yamashita, who was a kind of an independent star. She came in and she had a couple matches in Impact um last year. She was on the Multiverse show and did an episode of Impact. And I thought she looked tremendous, but Nisha Russell Slamovich, um, as much as I w- would love them, if we're talking about you know big, impactful signings as far as the tag team goes, that's the one, right? Right. Yeah, I never said I was a fan of them. I, I think Nikki <laughs> Bella. I think Nikki Bella is extremely hot, but um, yeah, I was not a fan of like their promo work, their matches, or anything like that. I was just yeah. I was bringing that up because she was bringing up names of girls she wanted to wrestle, and they happened to be in Impact at the time, Mickey James, Trinity, but they're not there now. So that's why I actually pulled back on that a little bit. I'm yeah, like, you know. Well, but I could, and well, and you and be honest, BQ, you brought them up because that thumbnail was going to do some business for you too. Like, oh that yeah, was of a, course. Yeah. <laughs> you get them on a thumbnail. That's extra extra clicks. I love it. I'm yeah. in that business too. <laughs> yeah, it's the same strategy I tell Impact, like 70% for your audience, 30% trying to get new people. Yeah. You know, um, that doesn't mean post and mow a joke clips. That means do something outside the box to get people talking. So, yeah, that was one of my my 30%, like, hey, let's get, you know, <laughs> let's bring some people in here. But um, And, and you, I wouldn't put it past Scott to put the titles on them. You know, yeah. he did it with the inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they, that would be doing, it's doing the same thing. And I could see them doing that. Like, especially when inspiration were announced, like, oh yeah, they're going to put the titles on them immediately. So, but, but I'll tell you what, if we're talking about potential challengers for the knockout tag team championships, it very, very well could be, um, Tennille Dashwood and, um, uh, what's her fuck? Uh, who's their WWE partner? Um, wasn't it Chelsea or no, that was an impact. No, I, no, no, no. Yeah. I don't know. No, I, no. I did not see any of Tennille Dashwood's run in WWE this last one. I I didn't see any of it. Yeah, it would no, it, it was her last run, not this one. Um oh my god, the bodybuilder chick. Oh, Dana Brooke. Oh, Dana Brooke, Dana Brooke. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. when you, you bring up knockouts, that's the one that I think that they actually like if you if I were to make a prediction. Like Dana Brooke would be the, my prediction. Like, like, hey, Mike, out of all these people, who was most likely to land in TNA? That would be the one. Yeah, I think that's a possibility. I, I've always liked her a lot, um, but I can see them challenging for the Knockouts Tag Team Championships. I could see uh, Ali showing up because if you notice, like Rosemary, uh, you know, Courtney Rush is nowhere to be seen. We haven't heard from Havoc since Sammy Callahan left. So yeah. you could do Rosemary and Ally. You could do Cherry Bomb and fucking Courtney Rush <laughs> as a yeah. you know. Um Yeah. And and so, yeah, Allie, cuz Ally did leave AEW and I think that um yeah, I, th- she's absolutely somebody I could see showing up for real. Regardless, they're they're dropping those titles. I'm I'm pretty sure of it. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I, I, I don't think they should. I think they were like really good as a tag team, but I see them bringing a couple girls in that take the phones. Well, JD and I talked about Hard to Kill on our show, and we kind of came to the conclusion that they're probably flipping every single title at the show. Yeah. Because so. you notice they which, put – go ahead, continue. No, I was, and w- I was like, which is fine, too. So. Yeah. No, I was going to say all the all the champions, every single one are baby faces. Yeah. You know, um, that's why I was saying – I, I feel that Jordan Grace is going to turn heel um, because I think – to, you know, heels are always more entertaining as champions, so they can't just flip the titles just to do it. It's got to yeah. be, uh, I think the, I mean, the X Division, that's a triple threat babyface match. So a babyface is going to win that one and be the title, to be the champion. Like, I, I just, I don't know. I really see Jordan turning. But I thought about it too, and I think the reason they had the champions they do is because I think they were more marketable for announcing these new championships like we can say whatever about tommy dreamer they're going to watch tommy dreamer receive the digital media championship before they click on crazy steve getting it (laughs) yeah you know 
And plus, I don't think those videos would have worked as well if they were appeals. Because, you know, they're showing like genuine excitement for these titles. You know, I, I don't think you can have, you know, Alan Angels do it and he's being a dick. You know, like, yeah, you know, so um, I think, yeah, I, I think there were definitely I think every single one of them will, will change. Do you, do you think there's any. Again, am I in left field with Jordan Grace turning to win this match? Because I just the, the, the reason I'm, I've been saying this is because Trinity this past year has been friends with all her opponents. She's hugging people. She's shaking hands. And I don't, I also don't think Scott Namore is beating her clean. That is, that is my, he's not going to, it's not like Dion is going to do the job for everyone. He's not doing that with Trinity. Like Trinity's going to lose one time and he's not going to make her look bad doing it. So yeah, I just I, don't you see know, I, baby face I, Jordan I, hitting the grace driver and winning, you know, one, two, three, and they hug after. I, I think that's exactly what's going to happen. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's going to be, I don't think Jordan's turning. This is just a prediction. So we could both be wrong, but um, yeah. I, because i I really do feel like Moose is going to win and Moose will probably close the show out on top as champion as a heel. And uh, I don't think you want to do that like back to back. Um, if I think Jordan should turn heel eventually, but uh, probably not on this night. And, you know, she was really, you know, when they were did the rebrand at Bound for Glory, she was front and center. They kind of want her to be the face of the division. So I, I could see I could see her yeah. just beating Trinity clean. And they've kept Trinity strong. So now Jordan beats somebody on the way out, right? Like, it's not like beating Deanna six months after she's lost everybody. That doesn't mean anything. Trinity yeah. hasn't lost anybody. So with Jordan beating her, she's beaten somebody. And now she's going to go over and probably compete pretty well in the Royal Rumble in two weeks. And so that I think that makes their top star in that division look really good. So I, I could see that. And I, and I don't think Trinity would have a problem doing that either. I, I, I think that she'll she'll do business on the way out. She's, you know, she's part of the wrestling family. She's an Uso. So she's uh she'll 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 do it right. So I yeah, I I I I, I just don't see that. I, I have pulled back on it a little bit because now that we know Trinity's leaving, there's no real necessity. I thought it was a necessity to turn Jordan to beat her, but yeah. now that she, we just know she's leaving. They, yeah, they don't necessarily have to do that. Um, and and yeah, Moose is gonna win, but they're not gonna go off the air with the heel. They never do. Uh, no. You notice on the television shows, even if the heel wins a main event, a baby face is gonna get some kind of comeuppance in the end. Like there's just they just don't go off the air with heels. Uh, so whoever shows up, probably Dolph Ziggler, is gonna yeah. Because that's how they do their 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 surprises. They come out, the music hits while the champions in the ring. They let them know they're the next challenger. That's just a TNA thing. Like you come in, you're a big name, you wrestle for the title right away. So yeah, uh, yeah, they're definitely going to go off the air with with someone big and probably him. I, I I didn't think he was a possibility before, but I do now. He just doesn't strike me as a guy who's like, let me go get the AEW money. I think he yeah. really wants better for himself, like Frankie Zarin, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I I think if AEW were willing to to bring him over, um, I th I think that he would go. But I think hopefully AEW realizes that all these WWE mid cutters are bringing over. It's complete overkill, and they're not adding to the promotion. Like, what is what is yeah. Johnny Impact or John Morrison adding to their promotion right now? He's not. He's 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 stealing money, and he's a great performer, but he's just. Like yeah. he's just another guy, you know what I mean? So, like I, I think that, um, I think that he probably would go there if the offer was right and, and they had a good spot for him. But I think TNA probably came in strong, made a strong offer, and it's like you're gonna be a top guy here, right? We're gonna push you like a top guy. You know, you're gonna do it in front of a thousand people, but we'll you'll, you'll still be at the top of the card, and we'll bring in strong right after the main event's over. Um, my prediction, and this could totally blow up my face, is that uh, Dollar General. AJ Francis himself, top dollar, will uh, will help Moose win the title and kind of be a part of his little, his um, his group there because they both got NFL connections. So I'm um, connect, connecting yeah. the dots there, and he's like a good hype man. He's a good heel too. Uh, as long as he doesn't wrestle, he's fine. And then then Dolph Ziggler comes out at the end of the show, and then that's how they they go off the air. And then they they build towards Rebellion where they do Dolph versus Moose and. I can. Um, I, I definitely see that. I said um, Tom Dollar was coming when he got released. Yeah. Because yeah. He already put it out there that he was in talks with them prior to them bringing him back. So I knew he was coming back. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, not coming back, but I knew they were going to revisit that. Yeah. 
So I can definitely see that. That's very much a possibility. Uh, they announced today that a lot of the, the the other signings would show up later in the month or whatever. So kind of giving you a reason to tune into the episodes, kind of like they did with Slammiversary where Brian Myers showed up at the next episode rather than Slammiversary itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I could see I could see so like you know two or two or three showing up at Hard to Kill right, and then yeah. um and then somebody at Snake Eyes and then if they do have more than that, which I don't know how much they want to expand this roster, but if they're gonna go more than that, Orlando's a good spot for it because that's where a lot of those those uh, WWE fired castoffs live. So it's like you could save money on trans. Do um one of the last things I'll ask you here. I brought up. You're saying the WWE castoffs, they fired a lot of people from NXT who we not familiar with, never seen them on TV. Like, would you would you bring in some of those people that in in hopes of maybe I don't know if you eat, you know EC3 is a great example, but someone who just really didn't do anything over there but got the got the necessary training, and then now yeah. you bring them here and they're more polished and you can do something very different with them. Yeah, Steve Macklin is the perfect example, right? He yeah. he really didn't do anything on the main roster. He got fired because Gunner was being a dipshit online. <laughs> so Macklin gets fired, and uh, they bring him over, and it's like, hey, this guy's got some good training. He's got some good skills, and they really honed in on making him a character. And then I thought, that, I think they've done a great job. Uh, EC3 is another guy, and um, obviously Eli Drake, who's now one of the biggest stars in wrestling. Um, they they really kind of got cast aside from that developmental system. And they they were able to hone their craft in TNA and be made into big big stars and look like a big star and then go back to WWE. So um, what what I absolutely like a lot of these guys are like you know like legitimate college athletes and some of them are from the independents and and um, but the only way I would do it is if you get a guy that's like EC3 or that's like Macklin that actually really fucking cares about their craft and they want to learn they want to get better. And they're they're looking at um, helping to be a part of something and build something. But if you're just yeah. getting what like and but Rick Boogs is the perfect example of the type of guy not to bring over, because he's already kind of got it like in his head like everything is else is second rate. So you don't you yeah. don't want to do that, right? So you, you want to bring if if you're gonna bring somebody, make sure that they love wrestling and that they want this to be their life, and that they want to hustle. Right, they want to sell themselves. They want to hustle. Right, so yeah, I, 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 I totally am. Like, you know, AEW picked up Parker Boudreaux, and like that was a guy I had high hopes for because he was like a college football player and had that great look. And you know, it never clicked for him. It never worked out. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so, so, and I know they they brought in uh they brought in two dimes over there at AEW, and so and a lot of these guys are just not working out. But um, and maybe maybe they could work out in uh in TNA because they, you know, they. They can, they do, they tape their shows months in advance and they can, you know, help them. A lot of their stuff is character work, you know, more character driven than any of the other promotions. So uh, I think they could. I wonder if Parker Boudreaux could end up in TNA. You know, I think he's, he's really bad. And if he hasn't improved over this, this amount of time and the problem with him uh, and the problem with a lot of AEW's young talent is they get to AEW and like, okay, we've made it. And we're getting this mailbox money. We're on we're on full time contracts, and they're not like Sky Blue. Like say people say whatever they want about Sky Blue, she's out there hustling. She's out there on the Indies every single weekend, trying her hardest to get better. Yeah. You're not seeing that with Private Party. You're not seeing that with Parker Boudreaux and Two Dimes. And like like AEW allows their talent to work independent, so that way they can get better, and they can improve their stock. They can improve their craft, and they're just not doing it, right? Um, and so they're, they're there, they're coming in for their paychecks. They think they're big time and they're collecting money and they're not producing. Right. Like, and I, I told, I told JD this a couple weeks ago. I was like, if I got hired by day, by Tony Khan, uh, day one, I would take that roster from 142 down to about 75. And I was like, you guys go out there on the Indies and I'm, I'll use you as day rate talent going forward when we have spots available in some of these towns. Right. Um, because a lot of them are just resting on their laurels. And so you don't want to bring people like that into the TNA. And I think Scott Demore has done a really good job of not bringing talents like that in. Okay, he f took an L on the Good Brothers. We can all agree they were cool for the first few months, then afterwards they were just lazy, right? Um, you know, oh. Heath, Heath, say what you want about him. He Heath was Heath. I don't want to call him lazy, but he didn't really do anything to improve his stock in life when he came to TNA. Right, he just kind of kind of rested rested on his laurels, um, even if he did work hard in the ring sometimes. But 
um, you got to be real choosy when you're bringing these folks in. Yeah, and, and I've heard on your podcast talk about Dango. Who, who Dango is different than when he showed up initially, obviously. Um, yeah. You know, on Big Con, like these are guys just kind of, you know, versions of their WWE name. Uh, yeah. Versions not, of not, not really. So there, there's a big difference, right? So the, those guys were lower card guys, never made it, okay? And um, and you would think that a guy like that would want to kind of get that stink off of them, but instead what they're doing is is they're just kind of taking the the product that failed and taking it elsewhere, hope and not changing it and just kind of being a part of the same. Like instead of you know his name was Connor in WWE, so he just cut off half of them and threw the word big in front of it because he's big, right? You're you're creatively bankrupt at that point. And I felt the same way about Dango, but Dango did eventually change the character the problem with dango is that as good as his backstage skits were and as creative as those were and he got rid of the dancing nonsense as soon as the bell rings he still sucks <laughs> so <laughs> so it's like you know so he didn't improve that part of his game um and so so but that i always go back to w morrissey i go back to steve macklin mm -hmm. as two guys that came to TNA, they were hungry, they wanted to reinvent themselves, they wanted to prove people wrong, and they absolutely did it. I don't think, I don't remember the last time anybody referred to Macklin as Steve Cutler. And I don't remember the last time anybody referred to Big Bill or W. Morrissey as Big Cass. I just don't. Right. It doesn't happen because they went out there and they changed people's perspectives of what they're capable of doing, right? And so that's the type of guys that you need in your promotion when you're a smaller promotion like TNA. Like that, those are the folks that you need. The hungry people ready to prove people wrong. Yeah, I, I say that all the time. That was a big difference. The early days of TNA, people coming in wanted to be a part of something, and now, you know, they were here for a booking. We just we just talked about that earlier. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up there. Going over yeah, man, we, we nailed it. So, yeah, man. Um, what time is it for you? It is uh, 9 p.m., 8.57 p.m. Uh, okay, it's 11 p.m. for me, and i usually in bed at 9.30 I get up at 4. I don't have I to get you. up at 4. I just, uh, I just want to get up. I'm well yeah, up, well I'm up a, before I need to. Yeah, I feel you there. I'm the same way. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, we're going to wrap it up. As I said, I'm going to put your... Um, channel link and a pinned comment here. So hopefully get a little more traffic over there and uh, you're doing good things on the channel. So want to help out a little bit, of course, do do my part. And um, yeah, man, we're going to wrap it up right there. So thanks for coming and doing this. And hopefully we'll get some more podcasts in the future. I think it helped now that I'm on Pacific Standard Time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there. we're we're yeah, we're a little bit closer. And then, um, you know, I, I can um on thursday nights thursday nights usually a good night for me because i do my mike and jd show and i typically do it like 6 30 p.m whereas before i was waiting till like 10 p.m before because i didn't want to take away but it just became unsustainable once i got here so we started doing my podcast more than the night so thursday nights i'm podcasting all night typically okay fair enough i'm gonna keep that in mind for the future so yep, yeah we're gonna wrap it up here folks thanks for uh checking out the podcast and uh should be doing another talk in TNA with Lewis Carlin soon enough. It'll probably be after Hard to Kill. So we're just kind of talking about, you know, post post TNA. Instead of uh, guessing what we think TNA is going to do, we're going to see what they do and then and talk about it. So uh, for Mike, I'm your boy BQ, and we're out. Peace.